Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Sarah. I am the Events and Communications Coordinator here at RACDC. Um, thanks so much for spending your Thursday night with us. I know a lot of us are perhaps feeling Zoom fatigue um, as of late, but we're really excited about tonight's meeting and the program we put together for you. We have some incredible speakers. We also have some really exciting awards to share with you all um, honoring some really amazing community members here in Randolph. Um, and we're really just looking forward to spending the next um, couple of hours together. Um, before I hand it over to Bob Wright, our board president, um, I just wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. So we're using um, Zoom's webinar platform this evening. Um, if you're an attendee, um, your audio is already muted. Um, you do have the option to connect with us through the chat and we will also have um, the Q&A function. Those are all available on the lower part of your screen. Um, we will be monitoring the Q&A um, section to make sure we don't miss any questions um, and can get those answered throughout the meeting and the um, speaker series. We're going to start doing the um, the um, Q and A for the speakers after everyone has ended. So towards the end of the meeting, um, and then we will also for the business meeting um, instead of doing verbal votes or in the chat, we will be using the poll function. So um, when the slides show up that there is a vote from members, which a reminder, you are an RECDC member if you have donated in the last three years or if you have um, been offered a membership position. So um, you will see a little pop-up screen at that moment when there is a vote um, happening and you will click on your option, um, yes, no, or abstain, and um, we will share those results. There's only going to be three polls during the meeting, um, and then otherwise we will continue on with the program. So um, again, feel free to reach out in the chat um, if there's questions or any accessibility um, concerns that we can help address. Um, and now I'm gonna do a little screen share here um, to get our presentation started and um, turn it over to our board president, Bob Wright. So just a moment. Hey, thank you, Sarah. That was a good uh, amount of housekeeping for us. I don't know if, if anybody can hear me or uh, these Zoom meetings, as you mentioned, uh, uh, do fatigue us from time to time. Uh, I do want to welcome uh, everyone for joining us tonight and uh, uh, sincerely hope that next year that we are able to actually meet in public. Uh, it's so nice to have a, a, a public event that uh, people can socialize and see people face to face. Uh, I think we're, we're missing that dearly. Um, I do wanna thank uh, Dan uh, DeVoe and Sarah for their efforts and work at coordinating this uh, uh, presentation tonight. So thank you uh, uh, for that. Uh, Tom Ayers, I don't know if you're on, but I want to thank you for crafting this year's uh, annual appeal. Uh, that was uh, very well done, and all I had to do is sign my name to it, so that's wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Um, I do want to have a special thank you to the staff uh, at the Jocelyn House. Uh, they've been working very tirelessly, obviously, through this whole COVID uh uh, pandemic, uh, first off, to keep uh, the residents safe. And uh, they've done a wonderful job. Uh, all of the residents have been vaccinated. Um, I think they're even getting their boosters uh, like in the next week or so. Uh, but there has been COVID uh, in the last three, four weeks. They've been dealing with COVID. Uh, I think they've got, uh, you know, somewhere up, up to like eight or 12 uh of the residents that have uh, had to quarantine and, and have meals fed to them uh, 
in the rooms and, and that type of thing. So the staff has been very uh, dedicated. Uh, they're, they're, they're there to, to make people uh, safe and as comfortable as possible. So a big thank you for uh, the Jocelyn House staff. Uh, we've had a pretty exciting year at our ACDC this year, uh, beginning with the move uh, of the RACDC office up to the third floor of the Bar Harbor Bank and Trust. Uh, Bert Blaze and all the folks at Bar Harbor worked tirelessly to make that happen. Uh, I think it solved a lot of logistical problems for the bank and has created some uh, very nice workspace uh, for our ACDC. Uh, this year, we've added some several uh, talented people to the RACDC team. Uh, Amy Urana and uh, Wayne Fontanella have joined uh, Sarah, Shaw, Nathan, and Julie, and they provide much needed capacity to the organization. Um, uh, Peter Reed, uh, about midway through the year, uh, recruited a great facilitator. Uh, Pam Mission, who's a PhD and is a professor at Binghamton uh, University in New York, uh, uh, provided uh, uh, a series of monthly sessions with the board and staff to go through a strategic planning process. Uh, she worked directly with the staff, uh, obviously, to produce some of the document that you might be reviewing tonight. Uh, so that was uh, uh, very well done and a big thanks to, uh, to Peter for organizing that and, and, and getting that going. Uh, also want to thank the board uh, for the support of the organization. Um, uh, we, we, in addition to monthly meetings, we have active committees that people work on and they do a lot of work behind the scenes. So. Uh, Thank you for the board members. Uh, we do are looking to recruit uh, two to three board members to fill some openings on the board. So uh, um, we're looking for uh, opportunities to, to add some folks. Our strategic process also has shown need to activate uh, several committees uh, to support the goals and objectives of the organization. Uh, board members and other members of the community will be crucial to get the representation that we need. Uh, we currently have, uh, you know, a housing committee that's working on Salisbury Square and uh, some other pipeline projects. Uh, we'd like to start uh, downtown and economic development uh, uh, planning. Uh, and in closing, I want to thank. Uh, Obviously, the RACDC membership, uh, all of our local donors and supporters uh, that help us uh, meet our goals, and uh, some of our institutions and large uh, uh, funders so that we have for uh, some of our various larger projects that we've got going. Uh, we've had a number of grants and uh, uh, people that are willing to support in, in big ways. So. Uh, really want to thank uh, uh, those folks. Uh, one last item uh, for my business is uh, approval of last year's minutes. Uh, normally we would uh, 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 have a motion and a second, and uh, then we would vote to approve uh, last year's minutes that are included. Um, in the uh, uh, agenda. So I, I see that Dan has uh, moved to approve the minutes. Um, I'm second. sure. A second, Pat French. Oh, thank you, Pat. So now uh, we are here to vote on approval. So Sarah guided us through that process. So. You should have a poll here soon. So with that electronic polling, 
uh, we'll see uh, how that all works out. So uh, I am going to hand this over now to our VP and treasurer, Peter Reed. Okay, well, it looks like we had approval of the minutes. That's great. Yep. Okay, so um, the I'm here to report on the financial uh, status of the organization, and uh, I uh, am glad to report that we're we're doing uh, a very good job. Uh, things are quite stable and performance has been good. Uh, I think RACDC over the five or six years I've been on the board has, uh, not because of me, but has been steadily improving its financial condition. And uh, I think we're in a much better spot now than we were a few years ago. Uh, currently, uh, the revenues for the count or the fiscal year 2021, which ended back in June, uh, the revenues were 1.5 million. And there's a breakout here showing just a kind of high level pie chart of where our revenue comes from. It's mostly from rentals with Randolph House being the largest and then other rentals and the other properties and services, especially at Jocelyn House. Uh, we received some, some grants uh, as uh, Bob had mentioned and uh, we about 3% of our revenue comes from uh, contributions from the community and donors, which we certainly appreciate. That's a a small slice of the pie that we would hopefully like to grow over the next few years. On the expense side, our expenses were uh, 1.4 million. There's a, a breakdown on the bottom left corner of, of the major uh, areas of expense with Randolph House again being the largest at over half a million dollars. Um, Jocelyn House, Jacobs Mobile Home Park, Armstrong Mobile Home Park, and, and then other expenses for various uh, programs that are, are managed, the downtown program and, and other, other things like that, and some, some new projects that we're working on. Uh, the, the 2021 revenue was up 16% versus a year before uh, with a positive operating result of $113,000, uh, which was very solid. That was up from about $8,000 in 2020. Uh, we did get the benefit of some uh, some grants due to COVID and things like that, but uh, I, I will emphasize that even though we have a, a, a strong operating result, all that money is plowed back into new projects such as Salisbury Square, and I, I think the uh, the better and more consistent financial performance of the organization has allowed us to start offering some benefits to staff this year for the first time, which was a, a, a big uh, thing on our action list that's been there for quite a while. So we're happy to get that started. It's not everything we'd like, but it is a good start. The, the total assets of the organization uh, grew slightly to 7.3 million. There's uh, basically a lot of real estate that we own. Um, and our net equity, which is basically assets minus liabilities, grew 6% to 4.4 million. So you can see from the chart on the bottom right that uh, our assets are growing steadily. Our liabilities have, have started to drop off a little bit and that has uh, led to a nice steady increase in our net, in net equity. So we're, we're doing well. We're, uh, there, there's always challenges with some of the big projects we're working on. There's always a little bit of risk of uh, getting the, the bids in right and making sure that the, the costs are contained. And sometimes we have to be a little more of a shock absorber than we would like, but uh, that, uh, that's something that we we know we have to do, and it's it's part of the, the game of uh, getting these projects done, especially on the housing side. So with that, I, I'm glad to answer any questions people might want to throw in the chat. Otherwise, if, if there are any more detailed things you might want to know, I'm always available, glad to uh, uh, receive any, any questions from anybody along the way and, and explain things in more detail. So with, with that, I think uh, as, the uh, chair of the uh, finance committee, I would uh, request your vote on the approval of the fiscal 21 treasurer's report. Move to approve. That was 
Pat making the motion. Yeah. And I guess I, I can second second I'll, that. I'll, I'll second that for okay, you. Okay, that's Peter. fine. And while we're doing the, the voting, I, I see there was a question in the chat box. Um, as far as what's in the wings, I think our, our biggest project that is right on the horizon is uh, a, a rehab of Randolph House and adding a new elevator and some new meeting space and upgrading a lot of the nuts and bolts there. It's a, uh, a nice building, but it's not brand new. Um, and uh, the next after that, we really are trying to find a way to uh, finalize plans for Salisbury Square to, to build some rental units there, which I'm sure Julie will talk about. And, uh, and also uh, eventually some, some owner occupied housing in that same uh, development. So it looks like our treasurer's report was approved. And so I will uh, send it back to, uh, I'm not sure who's next on the list. Pat French, nominations. Thank you, Peter. I'm Pat French. I'm a member of the nominating committee. And for several years, you got to see me every year. The change this year is we have pictures and you're gonna be surprised how old we actually are when you see us again after COVID. Um, some of these pictures are older. There are three things that I'd like to mention first. Uh, I'd like to thank the staff for all they've done for us this year. I'd like to reiterate that anybody that wants to volunteer from board position to volunteering at an event, we're very happy to have new people or the same people help us again. So just let Julie or myself know or any of the board members or any of the staff members. And I already told you about the pictures. That was the other thing. They're a little out of date, but very nice. We have four positions open this year. And it so happens that the four people that are in those positions right now are interested in continuing. Bob Wright, who is the current president, Peter Reed, who's the current vice president and treasurer, and Bob Moyer, who's the current secretary, and Pam Stafford. Uh, the four of them would like to be um, run and be elected again. So that's the uh, nominating committee's recommendation that these four people um, be voted on. Are there any other nominations? With that, I will ask that the voting now begin. It looks like the slate has been approved. Thank you. Hello, this is Julia Flynn. I'm the executive director of RECDC. Welcome to the meeting. I'm gonna take a little uh, tour through the year past and what we're looking forward to in the coming year. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we're gonna sort of base our tour on our strategic planning goals. And uh, one of the things I want to mention is that um, how uh, it is a constant eye opener to us, uh, the talent and generosity of the people in this community. Uh, Bob talked about Pam Mission, who is a local, new local community member who helped us through this process. and. Um, help the board and staff to reflect on our aspirations for our community and how RACDC's work can contribute to the health of not just our residents, 
and community members, but our business community and our social well-being as well. Like all good plans, uh, we hope this will grow and flex as we do and as we learn from doing. But we want to welcome your thoughts and, of course, your help in overcoming the challenges we face to reach a brighter future. And the next few slides will walk you through the basic elements of the plan and how our current work and future work is going to contribute to that. Goal one um, is uh, that all individuals and families in the Randolph area have affordable housing and the supportive services they need. Um, the way we look at this is that our homes are the platform on which our lives are built. They are where we eat, where we sleep, socialize, groom, and lately where we work and learn more and more. And imagine trying to build a life without a home. Imagine tackling all the problems that life throws us with no roof over your head and without enough money to pay the rent or the heat. So our ACDC is rededicating itself to maintaining the housing we have as quality, safe, and affordable home bases for our residents and building more housing to serve a wide range of diverse households, incomes, and needs to create a, a really well-rounded, healthy, and resilient community. Now, these projects take a long time to develop, a great deal of expertise and teamwork, and a lot of funding. But like Randolph House, which will soon begin the biggest renovation and expansion it has had since it was constructed 43 years ago, these homes serve our residents for generations. And so it is important that we continue to reinvest in them as well as to invest in our new homes. Um, more now than ever, our homes need to be energy efficient and energy resilient. And like the Salisbury Square phase two development that you'll hear more about later, we're working with experts to try to build a community of the future that will serve low and moderate income households with cutting edge technology. We were honored recently to have Senator Sanders visit Salisbury Square with us and have both Senator Sanders and Senator Leahy honor our project by choosing it from a long list of applicants for their congressionally directed spending requests. If passed through Congress, this would provide a $750,000 grant to help make our microgrid plans a reality. Following the V-Light or Vermont Low Income Trust for Electricity, a planning grant for $75,000 that allowed us to kick off development of the plan that you'll hear about from our speakers. These investments are very necessary to learn and to put that new wisdom to work where it's most needed. I'm going to go to goal two, that the area has a vibrant and diversified economy that contributes to the resilience and sustainability of the community. Uh, we were so happy this year to work with CAD models and prototypes um, and to help to the, bring this high-tech prototyping firm into East Randolph with a small business loan and then to obtain a, a small grant, a $15,000 grant for facility improvements. Um, now, there's no cookbook for economic development, um, as we all know, um, but I recently looked back at our annual report after Tropical Storm Irene. Um, the pandemic has been a kind of another crisis inflection point for us. Um, and in that report, we identified some lessons we learned about economic development that were reinforced by the pandemic now and by the example of so many of our local businesses. Um, and uh, a lot of these apply to CAD models and many of the other uh, sort of locally grown businesses that we've been able to work with over the years. And these basically revolve around um, the proposal that rather than looking for economic salvation from outside our community, these were lessons about how resiliency is really built from the ground up. And our takeaway is that resilience isn't created on the day of a disaster, it's revealed. And so these included promoting from within, in other words, supporting our local businesses and our people, focusing on attracting talent, not just business, building on our strengths and promoting what we stand for. And in the case of CAD Models, uh, whose president grew up in Tunbridge, grew his business in California, but decided to come back here because of the workforce, because of VTC's programs, because of the hardworking uh, workforce and the support of the community. Uh, these are all excellent cases um, for why uh, it's important to to stick with those, those um, sort of core values. And then 
a couple of um, even more important lessons that I think we learn in disaster and have learned recently is to treat each other with respect and to not leave anyone behind. As we learned after Irene and relearned during COVID-19, good neighbors are literally and figuratively sometimes the bridge that never falls down and they're always there when we need them. So I want to thank everybody for who helped during COVID to um, sew masks and deliver meals uh, and and do so many things to help each other and to help our business community through really tough times. Goal three is that people in the Randolph area come together as a community. This is so important because a, a community may be tested in crisis, but it's often forged in fun and in sharing that fun. And so um, COVID's been tough for that, but recently we've um, we've enjoyed sort of bringing back the event um, with those events that you see on the screen, the Welcome Back Amtrak, the Safe and Seen Halloween. Um, sometimes these have been modified, but they're important uh, places to share, to enjoy, to meet neighbors, to learn, and even to share or debate ideas. Um, Without that, it's really hard to feel like you're part of something bigger and that's what community really requires. So whether it's holding a cornhole event, a festival block party, playing Secret Santa to the local seniors um, or helping create a mutual aid group, we are committed to cultivating community spirit and community connections as reflected in those smiling faces you see in the picture on the screen. Goal four is, um, the oh so important RACDC has the resources to accomplish its mission. Um, and I guess the past couple of years has shown us more uh, than most how important committed staff and volunteers are to the work we do. Our latest employee, Ann Howard, came to RACDC because she wanted to serve the people here in the community in which she had lived all her life. She comes to us with talent, expertise, and a tremendous capacity for compassion and understanding. And we are very lucky to have her. We need people like Anne and resource to get and keep good staff to continue to make progress. So we wanna thank our donors, our staff, our volunteers for the time, the talent and the treasure that they commit to this and every effort. Um, you can see that, um, you can see our, our secret Santas on the bottom there um, delivered to really over a hundred seniors, these lovely, um, sort of uh, holiday gift bags during COVID, a time when so many of our seniors were isolated. And uh, it will bring tears to your eyes to, to read and hear uh, some of their reactions. Um, and one of them, I think at least is in our annual report, which I hope you'll take a look through. Uh, goal five is that RACDC collaborates with the other organizations in the community so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I think the best example of this this past year has been the Randolph Mutual Aid Network, uh, or ramen, as we call it, or to some of our staff, the noodle. Um, this is a great example of what we can and should do to support each other during crisis. And without ramen's organizations, local institutions, volunteers, and donors, so many people who received help would have had trouble dealing with everyday life. Um, so we are looking to also work again, potentially with Pam Mishan, whose generosity knows no bounds, to, um, to, to think about the future of ramen and how we move from a crisis to a more resilient and sustainable mutual support organization. So anyway, in just closing, thank you for everything people have done to help through a really difficult uh, year or two. Uh, we're really looking forward to doing more for the community and with the community with your help. Thank you so much, Julie, and to our board members here. Um, I guess this concludes the official um, business meeting. Um, but we have some exciting um, announcements coming up with our um, award honorees. Um, so I get to have the honors of starting us out um, with the Energy Rising Awards. Um, I feel really thrilled to share these um, for a couple of reasons. One, because the Energy Rising Award um, 
which has been presented to folks who in the community who show exemplary engagement, raise energy and contribute to the spirit of community um, was first, uh, I guess its inaugural award was first um, provided to my aunt-in-law, Dee Dee Bacon Tracy, whom I think if any of you have lived in Randolph at any point in your time know who Dee Dee is. Um, she is, was RACDC's beloved SASH coordinator who many of our SASH participants still speak. Um, so I'm very excited um, to present this award and um, similar to last year. Um, we are honoring um, multiple folks with this award. I, I think it's pretty beautiful to, to see that we have so many um, great folks to, to nominate. So for everyone's awareness, these nominations come in um, through uh, the community staff and the board, and then they are the nominations are considered and approved um, by the board. Um, so this year, again, we have two, um, well, it's actually four full participants, um, and uh, I'll get us started. So first we have Patty and Travis Burns of Kuya Sandwiches and Kitchen. Um, if you've been uh, in their restaurant, I'm sure you only have great things to say about their delicious food. Um, a little feedback um, and, and background of the work that they do and why they were nominated. Um, Travis and Patty first opened uh, first service on February 26 of 2021. Um, I think we all recognize that COVID was still very much um, a, a huge burden on our, our shoulders. And it goes without saying that it takes a lot of courage, tenacity, and perseverance to open a new business in such uncertain times. And yet, after spending several years working on the West Coast at owner-operated restaurants, the Burns has landed in Randolph, Travis's hometown, to manifest a dream worth creating. With a globally inspired menu and a locally crafted sense of community, Patty and Travis have brought an authentic and refreshing energy to Randolph's downtown business community. Since opening, they have not only served up amazing food, but have also created a space to feature local artists and musicians in their restaurant with a rotating gallery and music series that has helped amplify the work of the arts community. It's so humbling to witness how they continue to embed their business in the community, and we look forward to seeing them continue to flourish. So thank you so much and congratulations to Patty and Travis. Um, if you have not yet visited Kuya's, head on over to 29 North Main Street and you will not regret it. Um, congrats to both of you. And next to continue on with our food theme, um, our next honorees are Jennifer Bird and Adam Hinman of Taco Cat Cantina and Taco Truck All-Stars. Um, Again, the entire board was just thrilled um, to, to see this nomination come through. Um, when the pandemic hit, Jen and Adam found their food truck business in quite the whirlwind of uncertainty with canceled events. Um, and yet they pivoted to doing a series of pop-ups along Route 66 off the Randolph exit of all places, serving up their Mexican inspired cuisine with locally sourced ingredients. After a resoundingly positive response from the community, the two began exploring opening a physical restaurant in Randolph's downtown and voila, landed at 21 Merchants Row, the previous Black Crim Tavern location. And not only do the two balance both their radiantly colorful cantina space and Merchants Row, but also their food truck business. And they maintain a sincere focus on helping others. Since opening Taco Cat Cantina, Jen and Adam have provided meals to those in need through the statewide Everyone Eats program, which helps provide nutritious meals to Vermonters in need of food assistance via strategic partnerships with local restaurants and food producers. We commend their community-centered approach to business and the bright light they bring to our area. Um, thank you and congratulations, Jen and Adam. We are so thrilled um, and lucky to have you here in the Randolph community. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off to Julie again for the Hutchinson Award. Thanks, Sarah. And congratulations to Energy Rising winners. It's exciting. So the Hutchinson Award was created a while back um, in honor of um, 
a great character who died too soon, but who had exemplified during his life um, a really boundless uh, sense of giving to the community. Um, and so um, this award is named uh, for him, Jim Hutchinson, the Hutchinson Award uh, for people who live up to that, um, that incredible level of service to our community in, in a variety of really different and wonderful ways. Um, so I want to also say that our, our winner is Roz Burgess. And um, Roz and I spoke, uh, were invited to speak this morning and, and Kevin McAllister as well on WGDR radio about the award. And, and Roz, I was able to speak directly to, uh, to the award. And we, we are going to have that on our website uh, that you can listen to that. That will be up uh, and live tomorrow if you want to hear in her words, talk about what she has done at this park and what the award meant to her. Um, it was a lot of fun uh, to have that chance to, to talk, to chat together this morning. Um, and again, that will there will be a link to that on our website tomorrow. Um, so I don't think there's a much more potent example of the power of one person to make a difference than this year's Hutchinson Award winner, Roz. The award that she will receive in person, uh, which we can't hand through the screen, um, reads for her tireless efforts to beautify Randolph and inspire countless authors to cultivate a true sense of place in our community. The truth of the matter is, I'm sure Roz got tired many, many times. And to be tireless in your efforts doesn't mean you don't get tired. It means you keep going anyway, which is just what Roz did. For years, guided by her own vision, and desire to beautify this and other little corners of our community, she dragged stones and tools and plants and even water up to that vacant, unattractive corner parcel for years, inch by inch and plant by plant, bringing it to life with color. But the real miracle of her efforts is not so much in the success of her efforts, although the beauty of this garden is undeniable. The real miracle of her tirelessness and division is what it inspired in others. So Roz needed a place to put her tools and Joe Miller built her a shed. And the Rotary Club loved what they saw happen and wanted to help and recognize her work. So they did cleanups and brought benches and tables to the site. And then Sunny Holt wrote a grant application to recognize her work as well. Marjorie Ryerson asked Roz what she needed to help her out. And she said she thought a sculpture would be wonderful. And so Marjorie contacted local sculptor, Paul Calter, who donated his time to make that beautiful lemon lily sculpture that graces the park now. And then town workers helped hook up a water collection system. So Roz no longer had to bring her own water and the list goes on. So we each have, have it in us to inspire, it may not come immediately. And I'm sure um, if Roz uh, could speak to this herself, she would agree that it, it did not. But people can recognize dedication and devotion, is which is what we have seen and what we now applaud with gratitude in Roz Burgess. Thank you, Roz. <laughs> So congratulations to all our award winners and thank you for all your dedication and devotion and service. Um, we're now gonna turn to the speaking part of our, um, of our program. It's a timely discussion to talk about energy resilience, um, the cost and burden of energy and climate change is in the news uh, this day and, and many others. And, and often threatens those most with the least. And not only do we worry about the uncertainty that faces us, but the opportunities that they present have to be in the front of our minds as well. Rural communities have always been really good at resiliency. We value self-reliance, we hate waste, we work well together and we are innovative out of necessity. State and federal investments, entrepreneurship, technological advances have come very far the past two decades to make solar power, net metering and energy storage more affordable and more cost effective. And our speakers are going to help us learn the many emerging ways that energy resilience is now accessible to really everyone. 
and that it's more powerful, pardon the pun, than ever. And that it really, um, to be successful, really has to benefit everyone because it is only by you know, working together and finding those ways to be self-reliant one community at a time and to inspire others to find new ways to address our challenges that we are going to succeed and be successful um, in our lives and in our economies. So I'm very, very thankful, grateful that we have uh, four wonderful speakers today. Kevin McAllister, the first speaker, uh, uh, is a principal at Catamount Solar and one of the founders of that organization um, right here in Randolph. And Kevin's going to speak to some of the things that Catamount specializes in in the solar installation world. Jim Miriam is with Norwich Solar, another regional solar organization, to speak to a program that they have um, been developing for more institutional and small business supports uh, for uh, solar power. And then Peter Schneider, um, a sort of magician at Efficiency Vermont, he helps people everywhere. I don't know how he clones himself to get around the state, um, has been helping us with the Salisbury Square microgrid project and, this, and also with our, our uh, net zero home uh, plans and development is going to speak with Gil Vandebroek of Direct Energy Partners, our consultant on the microgrid pro, uh, pro, uh, project uh, about that and what a microgrid is and how it really has the capacity uh, to be a game changer in the future. So thank you all for sharing your wisdom with us this evening. We're really looking forward to hearing you, uh, your presentations. All right, I am going to stop with this PowerPoint and let Kevin take over and get us started. I think you need to enable my screen sharing. Okay, just one second here, I will do that. All right, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, I was teed up, but I, I don't see it. Let's see. There we go. All right. Can we see my screen? Yes. yes. Excellent. Yes. All right. Let's go. So um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invite to uh, let me present at your annual meeting. As uh, Julian Sarah said, my name is Kevin McAllister. I'm the founder and managing partner at Catamount Solar, which is Randolph's hometown solar design and installation company. You've probably seen our office, which is on Randolph Avenue across from Merchants Row, uh, shown in the slide there, the big yellow uh, Victorian house. And we have our warehouse down in um, Prince Street next to the bowling alley. We sublet space from the uh, food shelf. And so that's been a nice partnership um, residing and, and working with those guys. Um, I've got uh, 10 to 15 minutes to talk about um, residential solar, residential battery storage, uh, energy resilience in general for uh, focusing explicitly on, on residences going to speak a little bit about um, Catamount Solar and different things that we do, provide a little bit of context for why um, these technologies are growing increasingly important, and, and then some of the um, options for uh, going solar and uh, potentially adding storage at the residential level. Um, on so Catamount Solar has three main business units. We do quite a bit of residential installation um, all across the state. Um, we've been in business for 10 years. We're, as our logo says, we're a worker-owned cooperative, which is an employee ownership structure focusing on workplace democracy and 
uh, economic fairness um, among our staff. And um, as part of our goals as a work cooperative, we're a community focused company. We um, donate 5% of our annual profits back to community organizations in Vermont. Um, so we do residential, we do a fair amount of off-grid. I'm gonna mention um, when we start talking more about solar about the difference between grid tied and off-grid solar. Sometimes there's some confusion about that. And uh, we also have a fairly substantial uh, commercial business. Um, the photo in this picture is a recent project uh, completed in 2021 down at uh, Union Arena, which um, among other things, in addition to doing solar, has become uh, the first net zero ice arena in, at least in the US, maybe possibly further than the US. So it's kind of a big deal and they're, they're very happy down there with what they've been able to do. In addition to um, solar, which is our main work, we um, install the, uh, different products and services that are complementary to solar. And these include uh, cold climate heat pumps, so that, which are highly efficient um, electrical heating and cooling for homes and small businesses. Uh, battery backup systems, which we'll talk more about. Um, there's the picture of the Tesla Powerwall. Um, people are more and more familiar with that. And um, EV chargers, you know, they're not a real big part of our business, but um, when someone wants one, especially when we're, our electricians are at their site um, doing a uh, solar install, um, these level two chargers, which um, you would want if you had an electric car, you'd want one at your house, they require a, a separate uh, 240 volt circuit. And that's not a, a big deal to install them, but it, usually you would need an electrician. We're there anyway installing your solar. We can certainly put in your EV charger at the same time. Um, <clears throat> uh, excuse me. These are um, electric vehicles are beginning are becoming more and more mainstream. We, as a business, we're probably going to just start doing this for people, whether they need it or not, because it makes sense that houses should have these. Um, and so when we're putting solar, especially when it, when it makes sense and it's not difficult to install, we're putting solar on a garage system, we will just go ahead and put an EV charger in for people. Yeah, so they'll be ready for their electric car because they are, are coming, as I said. So just a bit about the, the context of why this is all important. Um, I, calling the slide um, greening the grid and electrification of, of society. We're doing this to, to stave off the most catastrophic event, uh, effects of uh, climate change and global warming. And the way that's gonna happen is by greening the grid, adding as much wind and solar to our grid as we possibly can, and not, not just our Vermont grid, but our collective grid um, nationally and internationally. And at the same time, um, moving completely away from the burning of fossil fuels and uh, carbon generating combustion to uh, electric appliances, electric vehicles, electric heat, everything is going to be electric in the future. And hopefully that electricity is gonna be produced by a carbon neutral grid focused on uh, renewables. Um, so more wind and solar. Um, the, the problem with wind and solar, of course, is their intermittent resources and the wind doesn't blow all the time, the sun doesn't shine all the time. So the importance of, of uh, storage systems, um, particularly either grid scale, probably a combination of grid scale batteries, as well as home and business batteries um, is, is what's going going to um, carry the day um, to make this transition. It's, it's going to take a long time for us to get there, but it's, it's already happening now. Um, prices have come down tremendously for uh, home solar systems. Uh, battery pricing is, it's frankly still a little bit expensive. Um, hopefully it's going to come down more. Uh, demand is extremely high for um, lithium batteries, uh, especially for 
because of the EV market growing. Um, but we are hopeful that they will be coming down for home systems as well. Um, before I talk a little bit more about solar, uh, I wanted to just explain the difference between um, grid-tied solar and off-grid solar. Um, there's still, I'm surprised, you know, solar's become much more mainstream. Um, people call us and tell us all the time that they want to go solar and, and go off the grid. And we always ask them first, oh, well, are you already connected to the grid? And most of the time, or a lot of the time, they, they are. And we need to step back a minute and say, well, if you're connected to the grid, you probably don't want to get off the grid because you have power from the utility. But what solar can do for you is um, provide your power from solar power um, through net metering you will make um, more power in the summer and less in the winter. When you're making more power in the summer, your batter or your meter will um, go backwards and you will create um, utility credits that you'll then be able to use um, at the times when you're either not using solar or when you haven't been able to make enough solar to cover your needs in the winter time. Off-grid systems um, are for people and uh, that don't have a utility connection uh, by and large. And there are quite a few people in Vermont that choose to live uh, reasonably far from utility lines where it might cost them $100,000, $200,000 to uh, bring utility lines to their remote house site. And in those situations, for sure, it makes sense to build an off-grid system. We do quite a few of these. Um, those systems utilize many of the same components, especially the, the panels and, and inverters that a grid type system with, would use, but they are, um, they're also dependent on batteries by, by and large, and also usually they have a generator. Um, that's that's the, the key difference. <clears throat> the batteries um, that off-grid systems uh, re require, obviously they, they're not making power at night. And so they have a battery bank to, to cover their power needs uh, when the sun goes down. They're, they're responsible fully for uh, creating all of their own power. So there's, there's a full a range of different types of uh, solar power systems, different sizes, different types. Um, we've done hundreds of them over the last 10 years that we've been in business. Um, what, what we generally do is um, go to, uh, when we start working with a new client or somebody who's interested in solar, we want to find out how much power they need and, and what, the, what the available space is. And that's pretty much what determines uh, the size of the system and how we're going to go about building it. Um, there are different attachment types for all different types of roof, whether you have an asphalt uh, shingle roof like the upper right, um, uh, different metal roofs, standing seam or channel drain metal. Um, we have a partnership with Timber Homes for Vermont to um, build carport structures that have solar on them, uh, like the photo in the lower left. Um, we can put them on the ground in even a, a small size ground mount. Uh, this is actually my neighbor up here in uh, East Montpelier. Um, 12 modules on the ground, didn't want it on his roof, had plenty of space on the ground. Uh, it works great for him, and he's, but he's very happy. Um, there are also uh, single pole systems where there's not a lot of space um, laterally, but uh, you can go up high and um, have just a single uh, attachment to the ground with, with a large array on top of it. So there, there are many different ways to customize uh, a system to make it work for your site. Um, the um, one thing to remember is that these systems are completely scalable. So the, the, they're, not, they're not a cookie cutter where you have to buy something that might be too big uh, for your needs or it, it ends up being too small if you're hoping it's bigger. Uh, they can scale upwards or downwards um, depending on your budget and or uh, how much power you need to generate. And, and that's the, the puzzle that we solve for you um, when we come out and assess your needs and uh, provide a proposal for you. A um, few words about battery storage. Um, things have changed in the battery world significantly. 
And um, the picture on the left, uh, old school uh, battery systems used to be made from lead acid batteries that um, required lots of maintenance. Um, they off-gassed hydrogen, so the systems had to be vented. They were a little bit dangerous that way. Uh, they had to, they were, um, those batteries have uh, water in them that needed to be checked, the levels checked and refilled with distilled water. And uh, they didn't last that long and they were very expensive. The newer systems on the right um, are lithium, lithium, ion, lithium, lithium ion batteries. Um, they're contained uh, almost as an individual um, appliance. Um, we saw a photo earlier of the Tesla battery. Um, you can tuck them away. They don't need to be vented. They don't require maintenance. They last longer than the old lead acid batteries. And um, there's basically just less to worry about with them. And they, um, the, you can discharge them uh, right down to zero without worrying about uh, harming them. So they're um, much uh, more user-friendly than battery systems in the past. So the reason the reason you might want to have a battery system in your home is is they provide backup power during a utility outage. Um, it's quite quite obviously, and uh, as we know or we're learning, um, we're going to have more frequent and more severe storms in the future, and. Um, and we're, we're, we're already seeing this. And with climate change and warming climate, especially for where we are in Vermont, I'm afraid we're also going to um, see more ice storms uh, likely, which may cause additional utility outages. So for security and resiliency, um, home-based batteries make a lot of sense. Uh, the other, Value, great value of batteries, especially when you also have solar, is that the batteries will keep your solar power system running when there's a grid outage. Um, without batteries in a grid tied scenario, um, a solar system is going to shut down and stay down while the utility is down because it's a um, electric code safety issue. Uh, we don't want to have uh, power running back onto the grid. Uh, for line workers who might be working on that outage problem. So uh, if you have batteries, the, the battery system will separate your home from the grid, create grid voltage that um, convinces the solar system that it's okay to generate power. So you'll have more, assuming in their sun, in the period after an outage, or if there's an extended outage, the uh, solar system will continue working generating power both for your um, home needs as well as power to uh, replenish the battery over time. So it, it creates a, sort of a, a double resiliency effect when you have solar and batteries together. Uh, also, uh, distributed storage definitely helps the utility and um, Green Mountain Power is a very forward thinking utility in Vermont. They have uh, several different programs that help people to um, buy down the cost of, of having these batteries. Um, that's too, the programs are too complicated to get into depth in, um, but there's a leasing program. There's also a program where you can own the batteries. Um, the reason GMP does this is because they, um, they want to use that battery power during peak load periods to help them reduce their peak load to avoid having to buy very expensive power um, from the regional grid. And so they uh, encourage uh, residential distributed storage um, and make agreements with those customers to share that power when they need it and, and they pay for that. And so that helps uh, to finance the cost of putting these batteries in. So um, just to sum up some of the key points that we talked about here, that um, to mitigate climate um, issues and the effects of climate change, uh, we're gonna see more and more renewable generation. 
uh, as well as the conversion of uh, fossil fuel powered uh, appliances and vehicles, et cetera, to electric um, as a way to reduce uh, the carbon burden and uh, hopefully mitigate the most severe effects of climate change. That uh, there's lots of options for uh, solar to bring solar to your home, whatever type of roof you have, as well as uh, different ground mount op uh, options. And the big idea I think is that solar plus storage, when you have them both, that will equal reliable power because the uh, storage will keep the solar running if there's an outage. That's all I have for now. Of course, we're close by and we're happy to help. Feel free to call us anytime, um, even just to chat about solar. We, we will love to help you out and uh, listen to your ideas. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin. We will let uh, Jim Merriam take over. Go ahead, Jim, when you're ready. Good evening, and like Kevin, thank you for letting me attend tonight. Um, I really love Kevin's presentation, um, and I think it fits with this meeting just from the perspective of how um, generating your own electricity builds um, businesses within the community, strengthens economic ties uh, in the community, and uh, he has some great pictures of just like people out working. Those are like our neighbors, and I just love seeing um, those types of presentations. Uh, so thank you, Kevin. Um, so I'm going to talk a little different than Kevin tonight about a, a different option. Uh, um, this one's geared more towards small businesses. Uh, and it's a program um, we have called the Small Business Community Solar Alliance, which allows small businesses to participate uh, in uh, the savings and the environmental benefits from solar, um, even if they don't have the space. Um, so the one of the benefits of the small business um, alliance is um, that it helps small businesses save money and so right out front we can help businesses save around eight percent on their uh, electric bills and i'll go into that in a little bit more detail um, and it also helps them uh, participate in being able to lower um, their carbon footprint or their impact on um, reduce their impact on climate change. Um, so to the right, there's a few businesses that we've worked with, um, big ones like King Arthur Flower uh, and Upper Valley Aquatic Center, uh, and then some um, smaller ones like River Roost Brewery um, down in White River Junction. Uh, so how does a net metering agreement work? So most of what Kevin was talking about, uh, and I don't want to be sweeping with his conversation, is about people owning their own systems. So in this particular case, what I'm talking about is uh, a third party owns the system, the solar array, and they sell output, um, the, the solar credits that are generated off the array, to um, small business customers, and the small business customers are able to um, get that power at a distant discount that gives them those savings. So a, a net metering agreement is the mechanism that allows that to happen. Um, so it is a very standard agreement. All of those um, entities on the front page participate in a net metering agreement. Um, and what it does is, is that each month, credits that are generated by the solar array, uh, your local utility, um, for most of Vermont, that's Green Mountain Power, and for Randolph, it's Green Mountain Power. It puts those credits on your bill automatically. And for simple math, if you have $100 worth of credits that are generated, those go on to your bill from Green Mountain Power. And then what you end up doing is paying $95 of those credits to the system owner. And you keep the $5, which is your savings. And in addition, because those $100 of credits offset the need to pay sales tax, you generally pick up another 3% in savings. So 
that initial 5% discount helps you generate a total of 8% savings off your electric bill. And so here's kind of like a, an example, um, a little weedy perhaps, but still just because it's a, a little bit complicated uh, to understand, you don't own the system, you don't put up any money up front, you basically are just buying credits that get appear on your bill from Green Mountain Power. And um, what then you do is you pay back uh, part of those credits to the system owner. So the first picture here is a uh, an elect typical electric bill. And a little bit of detail here, bypassable charges are the charges we can offset. These are regulatory legal terms. So this is the bulk of your bill um, are things that solar can offset. In 2016, um, there was a change made in the rules such that there are certain charges on your bill that you cannot offset. Those are called the non-bypassable charges. Um, so that's your energy efficiency charge, the low income uh, surcharge, um, and a few fees that are on your bill. So we can, on this particular bill, solar can offset the $1,000 on this bill, cannot offset the $80.86. Uh, and as we put credits on your bills, we can help reduce that state tax. So second, second uh, picture here is your bill that shows that in this particular month, you got $750 worth of credits um, and your state tax reduced from 64 to 19. Um, and then you get billed by the system owner, in this case, that's Norwich Solar, um, for a portion of 95% of those solar credits that you received. Um, and you pay that pack portion back to the system owner. So at the end of the, in this example, at the end of the month, you save $82.50. Um, so as I was saying before, um, the benefit of this, particularly for small businesses, is that allows them to, with a fairly low touch, be able to you know, save, save some money, but also help benefit uh, people and planet. And um, a statistic I like to quote is for every new kilowatt hour of solar generation that occurs in New England, we are offsetting um, a kilowatt hour of natural gas generation. So it is it is important, new resources coming on the grid have a large impact on being able to reduce uh, Vermont and New England's overall um, contribution to climate change. So I get to, in the benefit of my role, so uh, I didn't really say that at the beginning, so I work at Norwich Solar, we are based in White River Junction, um, I'm the CEO there, and I'm also a Brookfield resident, not a Randolph resident, but a Brookfield resident. Um, and both of my children uh, attended Randolph Union High School uh, with my youngest child that's graduating last year. So in my role, I get to go and I get to talk to a lot of boards and businesses, and there's some frequently asked questions that come up. Uh, so I like to address those because um, they're pretty common. So the, the first one is how common are, are net metering agreements? Uh, and the answer is they're very common. So almost all nonprofits and most businesses uh, utilizing solar uh, utilize net metering agreements for, for, for savings. Uh, and for-profits pursue the net metering agreements because they can uh, save money but they don't have to invest any capital uh, in, in terms of being able to save that money. And I'm not sure, so, so uh, sorry, the animation of this went a little off. So another question is, is that for a long time, the price of solar has declined over the years. So a, a fair question is, should we wait? And would we, you know, the opportunity for a bigger discount occur and the reality is, is from two perspectives, um, the answer is no. The first one is um, we've done a great job uh, collectively wringing out the costs of installing solar, uh, both from the material standpoint, the panels that you see here in the picture, um, those prices 
have dropped, oh, 90% or more uh, in just the last 10 years. Um, but they've basically stabilized and have gone up a little bit over the last couple few years. Um, and same with other equipment there. And then from the perspective of uh, labor and uh, the costs associated with installing, that's pretty much been flat. Uh, the other aspect is in Vermont, um, the net metering compensation, what you get paid for those solar credits since 2016 has declined um, significantly. And as a result, you can see here in this graph, um, that you can see a decline in the number of applications have occurred for net metering um, because of the decrease in compensation. So the short answer to this question is, um, no, you shouldn't wait and uh, everyone should act. Uh, another question is, is there operational risk or capital required from the customer? So in this case, this is owned by a third party and that third party assumes all of the operational risk. And there is no upfront capital required to participate by the small business. Um, and I've talked about small businesses, but the same is true for schools or um, any, any other uh, municipality or business, regardless of size. Um, and if the system does have a failure, which is very rare, because uh, there's not any moving parts, um, the third party owner is responsible for, for fixing that. Um, another common question, which is a really good question, which is how can um, the owner afford a discount to the customer? So it, a lot of times you can, see, when I talk to boards, you can see it on their faces, like this is too good to be true. You're saying I don't have to put any money out up front and I can get a discount off my electric bill. What's the catch? And there isn't a catch at all. What um, benefits the, the owner of the array is they get to take a 26% federal investment tax credit. And so that helps um, provide room for being able to give a discount to the customer. And so the, the combination of the um, federal tax credit and the ability to know that over a period of time, they've got customers that are gonna buy the power off that array, even if it is at a discount, allows them to be able to provide that discount. Uh, it allows them to provide um, financials and assurance to a, any, any lending institution that they'll be able to pay back the loan. So while it sounds to be good to be true sometimes, the answer is that it's, it's legit. Again, as I'll show you some of the, the participants that have done this, uh, this is a tried and true method of being able to install or take advantage of solar. Um, so it's a different offering than Kevin. Uh, Kevin, what Kevin presented uh, for the most part, nothing to say anything wrong with Kevin's um, approach. Um, this is just a different way for people to participate in solar and particularly helpful for people that might not have a lot of upfront capital or particularly if you're a nonprofit, you can't take advantage of that 26% federal investment tax credit. So almost all nonprofits go the route of the net metering agreement and take advantage of this type of arrangement. Uh, another one is, uh, again, sitting with we're talking here in terms of Randolph and uh, RACDC, do local communities in Vermont benefit? Um, and yes, um, you know, so each of these arrays um, pay annual property and school taxes um, and Vermont income taxes. Um, the array construction uh, supports uh, numerous local contractors, provides rent payments to landowners, uh, employees, uh, people at Norwich or Catamount. Um, and it keeps, I think, most importantly, our energy dollars circulating within the community. Um, and you can't ignore the fact that, um, you know, a lot of our customers are nonprofits, affordable housing agencies, municipalities and schools, those discounts have a meaningful impact on the community and help every resident in the community, particularly the most vulnerable, um, and helps keep and reduce risk to future escalations and costs for them. And it reduces the state's carbon footprint as well. 
So just a little overview of some of the clients. Um, a King Arthur was well, gonna make every one of these animated. Um, so this house on, uh, on the left-hand side here, um, this is the Randolph house here in Randolph. Um, we did a project with um, Randolph Area Development Community Corporation, or CDC, last year. Uh, and we did um, all of their properties. And it's actually this array on the left-hand side. Um, what I like about this is this array on the left-hand side was at um, Washington County Mental Health Services. So we originally did um, a project for Washington County Mental Health, um, supplying them with a net metering agreement um, down in Randall, I'm sorry, down in White River Junction on top of a large warehouse. Uh, they got to understand the benefits of it. They came to us and said, hey, we have some uh, land in Barrie that we can't utilize. Is there a way that we can install solar there? Um, they got a lease payment, which helped them extend the mission that they have. And then we ended up being able to build this array, um, which ended up having um, RACDC and these, these properties on it. It also had um, Capstone Community Action, um, which is a, the might moment from the weatherization work that they do and the low income services they provide. And then it also hosted um, or provided credits for uh, Champlain Housing Trust uh, for a property that they had. So through that original connection, it brought us another opportunity and it was able to provide um, benefits to a lot of great organizations. Um, so you can see from here the client list, um, a, a range of for-profit to schools, to municipalities, all taking advantage of this type of structure. And um, we're trying to, through this program, extend this down to small businesses that have historically kind of been overlooked in this process. Um, so, so that is, they're all using the same structure. I would say the difference that we're trying to push here with the Small Business Community Alliance is um, we're really trying to make sure that the, you know, kind of the backbone of our communities can participate uh, in being able to help the environment and save economically. Um, and this is a picture of Norwich. Uh, we, uh, best places to work in 2020, we're very proud of. Um, uh, we're a local business in the Upper Valley. Uh, we work with dozens of contractors uh, around the state uh, with hundreds of employees through those contractors. So it's, it is hard to emphasize enough the amount of employment that the broader um, solar industry brings, both in the construction of these arrays, but then also just being able to keep more of our dollars local uh, and staying within the economy. Um, we're the largest solar developer in terms of the amount of um, certificates of public good or permits that are um, derived in the state of Vermont. Uh, we have about 30 employee level wages, benefits for everybody. We're in the long process of becoming a B Corp accredited uh, organization. Uh, we also have an R&D group within our organization, which um, has won several U.S. Department of Energy grants. Um, and we're working on um, one of the grants was to help um, remove snow from panels in a passive way, solar arrays in a passive way. So there's, um, we can increase the output of arrays across the state of Vermont and northern latitudes in the wintertime when solar is uh, most in demand in terms of where it's needed on the grid. Uh, we also have another one um, to, to do some concentrated solar work down in the um, Southwest United States. Um, we have a, our own o and division, which is called Runtime Solar, uh, which just helps us make sure that the arrays that we build and others build are available and working to be able to provide savings and environmental benefits. Um, that we claim. Um, and another thing that we're very proud of in 2020, our solar installations provided $4 million in lifetime savings to low-income Vermonters. So this is predominantly done through affordable housing agencies and agencies like RACDC um, that have a mission of providing um, uh, housing to low-income Vermonters. 
and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you so much, Jim. That was awesome and so informative. Um, I will let Gil and uh, Peter take it away. Um, I'm hoping Peter will be joining us. I don't see him here yet, but maybe he'll make a surprise entrance. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Just trying to share my screen. I need to rejoin the call in a minute. In the meantime, I want to thank Gil for um, stepping in, Dusan, his, his colleague, um, and his wife had a, uh, had a baby recently, a little, little sooner than expected. And so um, Gil offered to... Uh, to help out in the pinch and we appreciate you doing that. Thank you so much. Okay, we're back online. Hopefully I can now share my presentation. Is this okay for everyone? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for, for joining today and, and thank you particularly Julie and, and, and Sarah for the organization today and the opportunity to, to speak here and share some insights with all of you. After having heard the, the two previous speakers, uh, Kevin and Mariam, about renewable energy in the communities, as well as incorporating battery storage to improve the resilience of uh, the communities in Vermont. Actually, I want to um, deep dive into actually the uh, electrical network infrastructure that we're trying to upgrade in one of the innovative projects that RACDC is, is performing nowadays, which is the Salisbury Square Housing Residential DC Microgrid. Um, I'm Giel van den Broek, and uh, I'm part of the design team working for Direct Energy Partners in charge of um, designing and developing the DC microgrid concept for this community, particularly with the objective to improve the resilience of the community. As the previous speakers already indicated, actually resilience becomes more and more important because our electrical infrastructure is being threatened by natural disasters, by climate change. Meanwhile, it's undergoing a significant transition from being a fossil-based uh, system towards a renewable distributed uh, electrical system. This is the site that we're talking about, which is the Salisbury Square DC microgrid that we're now envisioning, comprising 21 new units and 15 existing units. And actually, this presentation will be about the electrical interconnections between them. You may know or you may not know that currently, um, if you plug something into the socket at your house, actually, when you measure the voltage there, actually, you get an alternating current waveform. That's a difficult uh, terminology to just say, actually, that the voltage is continuously jumping up and down, positive, negative, and that happens 60 times a second, typically. The reason why um, the voltage looks that way is actually um, from history. So it's historical reasons that made us that currently we have such a voltage waveform. And actually what we're proposing here is a DC microgrid. And as you may have already guessed, we are planning to deliver here to all the different housing units, not an alternating current, but a direct current. So it means that the voltage will be constant over time. So instead of jumping up and down, it will be a straight line. You may wonder why 
would we consider doing this? And that's exactly my purpose of today with this presentation, to get you up to speed with why this makes sense to improve the resiliency of the community. So that's the central question um, of the first part of my presentation today. And actually to gain some understanding about the why DC microgrids make sense, we need to make actually a trip um, back in history, back in time, back to the early days of electrical power systems worldwide. Because actually, um, you're going to discover that the first electrical systems that were being deployed worldwide, and in particular, for instance, in Manhattan, where the first electrical systems were being installed by Thomas Edison, actually, those systems, they were powered by direct current. So back then, we had typical systems with a limited number of consumers, typically lighting, some small scale uh, rotating machines that needed to be powered. And they were powered by local on-site small scale generators. So that happened across cities in the very early days of electrical power systems. And we're talking end of the 19th century. So about 120, 130 years uh, ago. These initial systems were direct current based because that was the most evident choice actually to power them that way. Generators that were available that, back then, they operated at uh, direct current. However, they suffered one major drawback and that major drawback was the range that they could cover. They can go up to about half a mile. So it's fine if you can power from a small scale generator, um, some, some, uh, some housing units uh, within half a mile uh, in reach. But if you want to transfer more power or you want to uh, travel longer distances, actually direct current was not an ideal solution. So we were constrained in the distance that we could cover. The solution to that um, in the early days was to just place distributed generators all over the cities. But back then, these were steam uh, powered generators, typically also coal fired. So it was a nightmare in terms of the local air quality there. So they didn't prefer that solution of having multiple distributed generators uh, on site. Actually, this model of small scale generators continued all the way until the 1930s, 1940s, until the launch of the, the New Deal policy following the economic crisis back then, where large infrastructure projects were started. Large infrastructure projects that also focused on massive upgrade of the electrical infrastructure. And that required not to build small scale generators close to the load centers, but to build large scale um, power plants at remote sites, improving local air quality, but requiring um, long distances um, to be covered by means of uh, electricity transmission lines. So in the 1930s, this became the predominant model uh, of electrical um, generation, transmission, distribution, and consumption. So we have, and that's still the situation that we have today, we have large scale power plants, we have transmission lines uh, running to the communities, and then we have local distribution infrastructure to cover the last mile of it. The reason why, um, this infrastructure is currently operated by means of alternating current is purely technical because with DC, with direct current, we couldn't cover these distances of 20, 30, 40 miles at least. With alternating current, that was very easy to achieve because we could step up the voltage by means of transformers. 
So transformer technology was available back then for alternating current. For DC, that was simply not possible. So we were stick to low voltages, and that meant that back then the end of direct current. But times have changed. Times have changed in terms of, first of all, the types of loads that we need to cover and supply. Back then it was lighting, it was rotating machines. And basically whether you power it with alternating voltage or direct voltage, it doesn't really matter. They will both, both run. Today, the picture is completely different. We have electronics, we have multimedia, we have LED lighting, we have um, also for heating and ventilation and cooling, we're moving towards the electrical side. It was already mentioned, the future is electric. And also at the level of generation, we're adding distributed assets in the mix like solar photovoltaics. And that trend will only continue in the future because electricity is the most efficient way to power all those appliances. And you can generate electricity in a sustainable manner by means of renewable sources. And actually, what you'll notice in all these applications and that's indicated by the icon at the bottom, I hope you can see my cursor. So these icons actually indicate what type of current these applications generate or require. And the straight line is a symbol of direct current, while the alternating um, symbol is the uh, symbol of alternating current in this case. And actually the majority of appliances, the majority of applications that we like is direct current nowadays as compared to um, the lighting and rotation machines we had earlier today. And that explains why if you need to power your laptop, actually you need to have those bulky adapters in between because those adapters, the role of them is to convert the alternating current from your socket to direct current that goes into your laptop. And the other way around, if you have solar PV, you have solar inverters that do exactly the opposite, converting the direct current into an alternating current compatible with the grid. And that's how we do it today. Now, the future is becoming increasingly decentralized. So in a certain manner, we're going back to the future. We're going back to decentralized small-scale power plants so that long-scale um, issue with direct current is becoming less prevalent. Why is that happening, that decentralization? That is because big is beautiful no longer holds in case of solar PV systems and battery systems. There are some economies of scale, but large scale solar plants make use of exactly the same solar modules and technology, just at larger volumes and numbers. And those are the same as what you would put on residential rooftops. And actually those power electronics will get to the point where you get, you get the aha moment of why DC makes sense. If you dive into those, those laptop adapters, which we call power electronic converters, converting AC to DC and the other way around, actually what you notice into these electronics is a distinct um, part which converts AC into DC and then a smaller part which adapts the generated DC voltage in there. The same holds for your solar inverter at home. You have a yellow part uh, that does maximum PowerPoint tracking of the modules. So it's kind of control that's in there. Before we convert the DC electricity into AC in the red zone. So simplifying how our current system is being built up, we are building it in a way that we have a lot of DC DC and a lot of DC AC blocks. So we, for instance, generate solar power, we convert it into AC and we'll convert it back into DC to power laptops, multimedia, lighting, and so on. So that's exactly 
how we do it today. So there are a lot of blocks in the chain that are from technical point of view, no longer needed, but just because we're stuck with a legacy AC infrastructure to interconnect all, all these devices, it makes that we need to have this additional step in between. So what we're proposing for Salisbury Square is an approach where we adopt DC microgrid. We'll have the community powered from the utility, which will still be AC, but will centrally at the central bookkeeping building make DC voltage locally and distribute that to the units on site. And that allows us to eliminate a lot of power conversion blocks in the community. And that elimination of power conversion blocks delivers us a more efficient system and it delivers us a more cost-effective system because less electronics are required in the chain. So it's overall more cost-competitive um, as compared to the AC system we're doing today. Besides, this community can operate standalone, independent from the overall AC infrastructure. So if something happens at a higher level, at level of Green Mountain Power, actually the community can still continue exchanging power between the units. You can still share power with your neighbor. You can still make use of your on-site generated PV electricity. So it gives you a level of independence, meanwhile providing you a level of resilience. Besides that, by moving toward DC, we can also put in thinner wires or equivalently, we can make use of existing conductor material uh, to transfer more power in between the homes uh, that are planned there. And that's an interesting feature, particularly looking at the uptake of electric mobility and the associated charging needs that come with it. Now, DC microgrid technology may be for some of you the first time that they're confronted with it, but actually um, in the last 15 to 20 years, actually it has been introduced in more and more applications worldwide. Not gonna run through them uh, all by one to motivate why and how, but actually one of the first adopters was were data centers, the Facebook, Google data centers, there those advantages really are already economically viable today. Commercial buildings and districts, same type of rationale we have there, simplify the overall electronics that are integrated in the power system. Within industry, they use DC. Within street lighting applications for public lighting, they use it because they can cover longer distances basically, and they require less transformer stations in the chain. For electricity access for rural electrification, there are about um, 4 million systems, solar home systems being deployed in uh, communities that are in developing countries. And then last but not least are mobile applications like aircraft, the shipboard, power systems. That's where DC is already becoming an important technology. And now we're making the move towards a residential DC microgrid at Salisbury Square. So what we're going to do is at Salisbury Square is we're going to interconnect the housing units to uh, DC infrastructure running at uh, 380 volt DC and 760 volt DC for the solar carports, uh, providing charging points for the vehicles. And we're gonna supply all those houses from the central, um, central building, the bookkeeping building, which uh, has a single connection to the utility overall. Within that building, we have also uh, energy storage plant. And the advantage of having that energy storage for the community centralized at that location is that actually you can provide grid services to Green Mountain Power. Green Mountain Power will use those battery assets in times when uh, they uh, have a shortage of generation on the grid, for instance, peak load times. And that way they prevent that they need to um, 
need to turn on peaker plants, which are typically high with, with high carbon emissions in there. So we're contributing to the sustainability of the overall power system that way. By putting it centrally, we can immediately release that power to the utility without um, actually um, jeopardizing our local infrastructure or overloading our local infrastructure. In case of utility outages, we from we can from the main building keep on keep the lights on uh, in the entire community. That's our goal. Within the homes, actually, it's pr pretty simple what we'll do. Actually, we'll collect the solar generation. We'll convert it locally into 380 volt DC. We'll route it to the central building, and we'll also have a second connection entering the building which will then uh, power the lighting sensors by means of um, a separate volt server. And in case there is some legacy AC equipment and there are some sockets that still require alternating current, so to be kind of backwards compatible, we will still generate uh, AC within each house um, as long as uh, we consider that a kind of transition uh, measure that's in there. In terms of um, improving the resiliency of, of the community, actually, um, we plan for having about one megawatt hour of battery storage installed in there, which enables the residents to cope with an outage of approximately two days um, without any load shedding or, or whatsoever. So the main loads can be powered continuously for two days by providing that amount of storage. As I already indicated, um, DC microgrids um, have already entered um, the market in particular applications. So you may, arc, may wonder, okay, what makes Salisbury Square so unique? Um, and actually, one of the main points of Salisbury Square is the scale. We're incorporating the 36 housing units into a single DC microgrid infrastructure. And that proves to be a challenge from design and engineering perspective. So it's really a first of its kind project that we're, we're realizing here. However, it has um, a tremendous um, amount of opportunity to scale and to be replicable in other communities. And that way we move from a system where everything is centrally controlled and where you have central failures that make, make that entire community cities suffer from blackouts, for instance, like in Texas, we move from that type of system to a system where we have more distributed small scale cells, microgrids that can operate for a certain period independent from the larger whole. So we really uh, take on a divide and conquer approach where each community can um, take, take care of his, his own for a certain uh, period of time while still being interconnected with the, the larger system in there. But in case of contingencies, they can fall back on their own resources and continue operating, generating as they used to. Within the design process, um, because we're looking here at low to moderate incomes, we took, took in costs from, from day one in, into, the, into the mix. So that's another important factor that distinguishes this project from other demonstrations worldwide, which were typically pilot systems where costs didn't, didn't really matter. In this case, we do factor in costs from, from day one. We're also closely collaborating with Green Mountain Power as utility to see how one benefits the other. And for instance, providing um, the battery storage asset to, to cope with peak demands is one of the main uh, advantages that they see from the DC microgrid towards their system. So we're not only providing value to the community, we're also providing value to Green Mountain Power and in return from for that actually also the financial picture for the community becomes more interesting. 
Also, we involve um, major stakeholders to get this DC project off the ground. One of the things that I didn't talk about yet um, is um, appliance manufacturers. Um, we'll provide some AC sockets to power legacy AC infrastructure, yes. But um, at the same time, we're working with tier one uh, appliance manufacturers that will provide uh, kitchen equipment, induction cooktops, uh, refrigerators, freezers, um, washing machines, dryer combinations, you name it. And actually, for them, this, is, this project is also a catalyst because they are waiting to get that catch-22 resolved. And let me explain that more in detail. Actually, currently, a lot of appliance manufacturers are looking at DC. They see the benefit. They recognize them. But at the same time, they say, OK, but there are no systems in place yet. And because there are no systems in place yet, um, why should we bother uh, serving that market? Why should we set up a separate production line or modify our existing appliances? Why should we go that extra mile if the market uh, size is still relatively minor? And actually, there are these type of projects that they're highly interested in because it can really um, be a catalyst and initiator to prove towards their upper layer management that they need to start taking DC seriously. And they're def they definitely are. Uh, we're really surprised about the, the response that we got this far and very likely within the Salisbury Square DC project, we will get the first uh, DC home appliances from, from a major manufacturer in there. Principal benefits, uh, in summary, for the utility, utility grid support, I already talked about that, but also more importantly, there are important benefits for the residents uh, in terms of resilience. We have two days of backup power available on site, which is shared with the community. So that also enables to keep the amount of storage um, limited as compared to providing a storage unit for each and every house individually. We'll have a higher level of power quality. So in case of disturbances at the utility side, they won't propagate into the community and won't affect them. And at the same time, we're aiming for an economic return, of course, by providing that utility grid support while at the same time by means of a dc infrastructure lowering the capital expenditures up front and the operational expenditures during the operation of this system because we will be more efficient we'll be able to um, run this system and make use of uh, better use of the on-site generation and that's significant uh, in terms of the the numbers that we run thus far we're talking about capital expenditures that can be lowered to about with about 20 to 30 percent uh, in total. So less infrastructure to be put in. Operational expenditures, we we uh, calculated actually we can anticipate about five to ten percent of, of energy savings uh, on an annual basis. If you translate that into number of PV modules, it makes that you can. Uh, make better use of your PV uh, systems uh, on site. That concludes uh, presentation for today. I hope I could convince you about the main benefits that DC microgrids uh, bring and the unique innovative project that we're conducting here uh, together with VEIC and uh, RACDC. And uh, we hope that this uh, becomes a reality in uh, the upcoming years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gil. Um, we now have some time to have a Q&A. So I'm just going to share a screen with some of our um, RCDC's uh, contact information in the meantime, but feel free to start asking questions in the Q&A or as uh, in the chat, um, or if you have any other feedback, um, I see some um, positive um, some positive uh, reinforcements in the chat. So um, feel free to ask questions now while we still have all of our presenters available.
while people are thinking, this is Julie, I just want to give a special thank you to all our presenters for um, really well done presentations. Thank you so much. We've come such a long way. Um, I, I just want to throw out two on the um, just watching the DC microgrid process unfold. Uh, and I'm sure this is true for all of our presenters that it's fascinating to see the team run up against real time challenges like, oh, no one actually makes this part now. <laughs> and to see how that doesn't stop them, <laughs> which is another um, sort of a, a, a very ROS like approach to challenges. You just keep going. Um, uh, and I, my hat's off to every single one of uh, the folks that, that do this work. And we're so grateful to be working with such talented people. Um, so anyway, thank you. I hope there are, are questions because this is, um, you know, it's a rare opportunity <laughs> to have uh, this kind of uh, wisdom and, uh, and talent available for, for your questions. Thanks so much, you guys. We had a more of a logistical question about the event in general, about um, whether the recording of this event will be available. And yes, it will be. Um, we'll be downloading it and getting it up on our website by tomorrow, um, Monday at the latest. We are thankful that uh, Wayne Fontanella, who is our housing specialist, also wears another hat um, as somebody with a lot of neat tech experience and conference recording. So he may also um, break it up into sections so people can view just the meeting or they can view just the awards section or they can view just um, the speaker series. So those are all options. They will be available on our website. They'll be on the annual meeting webpage, um, recdc.com slash annual meeting. Um, and we will also have it uh, linked to our um, homepage as well. So folks will be able to access this again. I know it's a lot of great information to be digesting. So um, keep a lookout for that. Yeah, I'm happy to um, do that. So um, going in order they were received, um, Jim Miriam, I love the microgrid application for low and moderate income. What is the target cost for the microgrid on a per house basis? If there's a better way to phrase, please do. Gil, I think that might be for you perhaps. Yeah, I'll take that one for sure. Uh, yeah, we're, we're currently evaluating that. We, we run through the first numbers in there. Um, and, and I mean, the ballpark I already mentioned during the presentation, I mean, if you look at the power conversion infrastructure that you typically need for each house, like putting in an inverter, putting in possibly an additional inverter for distributed storage. And as compared to that, we can save about 20 to 30% of, of, of the cost on, on those, those components in there. Um, however, we're also in part centralizing that infrastructure in the communities, so it's more complicated to like really attribute how, how you can save that on, on a per house basis. You, I think you need to look really at the community level um, to, to make a proper, proper judgment and taking all, all that infrastructure together. Um, that being said, the definitive answer um, uh, I don't have yet at this moment, uh, as we're still reviewing and kind of fine tuning and looking how different architectures can improve that results. Um, but actually in, in the upcoming uh, month or so, we're planning to release uh, our report where we, we will uh, publish like the, the data um, and, and the, the simulations that we have performed for these different uh, DC microgrid architectures. So uh, to be continued, I would say. Great, we had another question about, um, are there any DC microgrids deployed or would this truly be a first time project? Are there any deployed at a smaller scale? I guess that's another one for me. So, um, so yes, there are other DC microgrids deployed. 
um, especially in Europe, in, in Japan, we have quite some projects uh, ongoing there. But in terms of the scale and that really distribution level, so really sharing power between the houses, that's uh, really a first time uh, to our knowledge. Um, so um, it's, it's really the scale that distinguishes this project from the other ones. Um, in terms of power level, there are similar projects being conducted worldwide, but not for, for residents with so many different consumers connected to the same, uh, same system. Um, so that also means that we are uh, facing also other dif difficulties. Uh, for instance, and that's far from the technical side, but for instance, with Green Mountain Power, we're discussing, okay, what will be the tariffs that will be used at, uh, at this microgrid? Secondly, who will own this microgrid? Is this Green Mountain Power that will supply DC into the homes? Is this something that's community owned or third party financed? Those are all questions that pop up and that we also need to resolve together with them. So we're working hard on that. So on all these aspects, the fact that those questions don't have a definitive answer uh, tells us, I think, that this is really a first time project of, of its kind. Thank you. Um, this next question sounds like it could be for all of our presenters. It comes from Dan. Um, one of our board members. Uh, do you know what the impact could be for solar and things like microgrids with the two bills being discussed in Congress? This is Jim. I'm happy to take a part of that and I'm sure that uh, uh, others might have a additional content. A couple things, you know, provided it passes. Um, one for Low income and nonprofit, one of the exciting pieces of the infrastructure bill is basically um, changes to under the investment tax credit. I think it's section 25D and section 40, which basically allows um, low income or individuals without a tax liability. So nonprofits and low income uh, individuals to actually get a grant in lieu of a tax credit. Um, so, you know, I talked a lot on this presentation about the only way nonprofits can really benefit from solar is through uh, a net metering agreement because they can't take the tax credit. So there is uh, in this bill, the ability for nonprofits and low income individuals without tax liabilities to actually um, participate and get a grant in lieu of a tax credit. So that's fantastic. Uh, and that's eligible for for-profit businesses as well. So you actually can get a grant upfront as opposed to waiting um, for a tax credit. Uh, another one is, is on that same investment tax credit. So that's that 26% for solar that I was talking about that really makes these things, makes these projects tick. Um, I believe it's a 30% tax credit is going to be extended for battery storage. Uh, so for those things that Kevin was showing, um, and for the microgrid, um, uh, that would be another exciting way to help basically lower the cost of um, all of these technologies that provide a lot of benefits uh, to indiv individuals. Thank you, Jim. Um, in the interest of time, I wanna get to these last two questions that came in. Um, one, um, how much does this, this, I'm assuming microgrids, um, rely on micro trips that seem to be in a vulnerable state of potential short supply. So anything that um, micro chip shortage could impact with um, microgrid technology. Yes, for sure. It has an impact the overall shortage of, of semiconductors. Um, but I think that's that's in, in general the case for not just microgrids, but also for any type of electronics that we put into our power system, uh, as well as for solar photovoltaics, which are in essence also semiconductors on, on their own. So uh, yes, the worldwide chip uh, shortage makes a dent into the development of renewable power and their connection into the grid. Um, the point I'd like to make is that actually by adopting such a DC infrastructure, you need less of the semiconductors overall to put it in, into this system. 
So that may make you somewhat less vulnerable to uh, these type of shortages if they would uh, would continue the way they are, or if they would reoccur some at some point in the future. Thank you. And last question. Considering the half mile range for DC and the similar size of most Vermont towns, it seems many towns could be planning smartly for the day when the technology is ready for mainstream. Is that far fetched? Um, no, for sure not. Now, um, one, one important note there is that um, the, the limited range of half a mile basically applied back in the early days of power systems because the DC voltage was lower. Currently, we do have the technology to move towards higher DC voltages. Consider, for instance, electric vehicles. They can move up to 400, 800 volt DC and, and higher. Solar PV on rooftops is already typically operated at 600 volt and moving higher to 900 or even 1.5 kV. So that limitation back then was primarily because of safety reasons, and secondly, because of lack of these power electronics in between. So it's no longer a constraint that we're facing today. Wonderful, thank you again. Um, those are all the questions that have come through. Um, Julie, do you have any other last thoughts before we end the meeting? Um, no, just thanks to all. I, I did uh, I did check our history books here, and in 2008, at our annual meeting, David Blittersdorf, who you may know from NRG Systems and All Earth Renewables, um, addressed this group and told uh, told the audience then in person, of course, that the future was electric. And I'm guessing 75% of the people who were there left the room thinking he was crazy. Um, and yet today when we say it, I think probably uh, most of us believe that that's the case. So um, hail to our, um, uh, the people who see the future more clearly than, than some of us do. And, and for the people like our speakers uh, for making it happen. Very grateful and um, grateful to the staff and the board, everyone who attended. And um, please spread the word. This will be available off the website for others who couldn't attend with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here. And one last plug, our um, 2021 annual report is coming out soon. So keep an eye out in your mailbox and on our website, um, uh, give that a look for more detailed um, descriptions of all the things we've been working on and opportunities to get involved. Thanks again, everyone, and be well and have a great evening.